Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Simeon Morrow Public Speaking and Presentations, Vienna Live with Simeon Morrow and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please turn off your camera and or microphone and or go, go to the LinkedIn Live video feed, the link to which I'll now place in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. This show thrives on participant contributions and all participants are encouraged to actively participate in this webinar by asking questions and making comments. To do so, please either write in the chat room, raise your hand, or turn on your microphone to say hi, and I'll be delighted to include your perspective in the conversation. Tonight, our featured guests are William Dreschowitz, a, an award-winning essayist and critic, and Jonathan Zimmerman, an education historian and author of Who's America? Culture Wars in the Public Schools, the second edition of which was just released by the University of Chicago Press. We are also pleased to be joined by Professor Lino Rivera of St. Mary's College of California. Tonight, the subject of our conversation will be William Dreschowitz's latest book, The End of Solitude, Selected Essays on Culture and Society. Bill, welcome. Thanks. Thank Bill, you. Do you, got, do you have a copy there? I do. It's right over there on my desk. <laughs> okay. I was going to ask. Thank you, John. I just wanted, <laughs> wanted people to hold it up. Um, Bill, so tell us a little bit. Uh, tell us about yourself, please, and how you became interested in writing. Uh, I am a full-time writer. I write about, uh, broadly speaking, cultural issues. I've done a lot of book criticism. I was a dance critic once upon a time in the 90s when I was in graduate school studying English Lit. I write a lot about higher ed. I was an English professor for 10 years uh, at Yale before I... Uh, was involuntarily delisted from academia, as I discuss in one of the essays in my book called Why I Left Academia, parentheses, since you're wondering. Um, how I became a writer, well, you know, I start the preface of the book by saying, I just, when I was around 12 years old, I just found that I had started making little speeches in my head, little polemical arguments. I don't know where this came from, but I just did it. And so um, it's not so much that I became interested in writing. I think writing was just interested in me. And uh, I just needed, I just something that I've always needed to do. Uh, you know, I'm a youngest, I was the youngest of three. And my older siblings were fairly, you know, six and eight years older than me. So I didn't really have a voice like around the dinner table. I think that might have something to do with it. I think a lot of, uh, I read a female writer who, I can't remember who it was, but she said that women write because their children won't listen to them. But uh, I maybe in my case, it was because my parents and siblings wouldn't listen to me. I don't know, that's the best explanation I have. I think that's pretty good. And that's uh, maybe why it was so polemic. So excellent. John, uh, welcome. Thank you. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you met Bill? Um, well, I'm a historian of uh, education and mostly in the United States of K through 12 and higher ed. And the way that I met Bill was through reading his book, Excellent Sheep, which I still think is the best book about elite higher education and is very much focused on that, that I've read. Um, I teach it every fall to my first year seminar, which is called Why College? Question mark Historical and Contemporary Perspectives. And Bill is always kind enough to join us via Zoom. Uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's always the most popular book. Um, I have learned to end the course with it, not begin the course with it, because, <laughs> well, it just, I, you know, like everything in teaching, it's an art and not a science. And I found when I began the course with it, people were very defensive. 
but by the end of the course, they're not at all. Um, and they're actually much more curious. Um, uh, and I think uh, that book has done more to shape the way that my students see higher ed than uh, anything that, uh, that, that I've read. Um, and so I'm really delighted to be here celebrating his new book. Fantastic. So Bill, tell us this book, The End of Solitude, it's very funny because when I first heard of it, I thought, oh, well, he's talking about the end of the pandemic. And then when I opened it, of course, the essay, it's talking about how important solitude is and that uh, this solitude brings um, brings with it this individuality that you can't get anywhere else. But that's just a side note. Tell us why you decided to publish. It's a book of essays that goes beyond just solitude. There are many, many things. Why did you decide to publish this? Uh, it's a it's a fairly mundane answer. I, you know, write a lot of essays. Um, some of them get a lot of attention. Some of them get very little attention. Uh, I wanted to gather what I considered my best work over the last, well, really since I started, most of them are since I started being a freelance 2008, but some of them go back to the 90s. So my best work over my so far career as a free as a as a writer of essays on a on a on a fairly wide variety of topics uh to have them between two covers so that you know they were all in one place for people who were interested and, and some some kind of sort of statement of like this is who i am as a writer uh it it there is no meaning to the fact that it came out this past summer which also happened to be the second year of the pandemic uh, it just came, I mean, I'd wanted to publish this for a long time, and for reasons that I won't bore the audience with, I, my agent kept telling me to wait, and uh, so I finally got it out when I got it out. It is, I never thought about what you said, uh, that, you know, reading, you know, seeing it in the summer of 2022, it might be about we're finally coming out of the pandemic. Um, the title of the book is the title of the first essay, which uh, came out in 2009. The End of Solitude. You know, neither the title of the book nor the title of the essay were my title. You know, editors like sort of splashy titles. Uh, I think my title for the essay was simply The Decline of Solitude. But it was, it was a response to uh, my experience of my first year on social media, right? So I joined Facebook in 2008, which seemed to be around when my age cohort joined, because I joined because my friends were joining. I was in my mid forties at the time. And I was immediately struck as I think many people must have been about how this new thing was reshaping not only our relationships, but our consciousness. And my point is we may still be alone physically, but there's this thing called solitude that isn't just aloneness, it's a certain way of experiencing aloneness. It's kind of the opposite of loneliness. It's a sense of fullness in being alone, being alone with oneself, being alone with a book. Um, that uh, seems to be evaporating. Uh, let me just say quickly that I think what got me onto this indirectly was that I taught a course in the literature of friendship at Yale in I think 2006. And for one reason, one day we were talking about solitude or I was promoting the virtues of solitude. And one of my students said, why would anyone ever wanna be alone? What can you do by yourself that you can't do with other people? And another student said, I'm afraid to be alone. Uh, and in retrospect, they probably had already been on Facebook for several years. So that's what made me realize something's happening in the culture, Okay. in our, in our consciousness. So John, uh, I want to get your perspective, an outsider's perspective on Bill's writing. Uh, it seems to me every page of the book uh, is communicating. It's not like Bill's talking to himself. He's making an argument almost as if he would in, a, in, in, a, in a, a seminar room. He's making an argument to other people. He's saying, look, I see it this way. It's very harsh criticism normally of a lot of different aspects of social life. Um, but as I, I said, it seems like you could read it as, as a lecture. Everything he says, he's speaking 
he's not talking to himself. He's not working out ideas. He's he's making an argument. Good. Is is that the way you experience it? How do you read it? Well, very much so. And I should say one of the reasons I assign excellent sheep isn't just because I think it's the best critique of elite higher ed. It's actually because of the writing style. It's because of precisely the elements, uh, Simeon, that you were describing. You know, I think our students have been miseducated to think, first of all, that you have to use a lot of jargon and fancy words that other people won't understand in order to communicate. And obviously, it's precisely the opposite. But I think even more so, one of the things they've been educated to believe is that either you're writing about some objective world out there or you're sharing your personal thoughts and that these two are somehow perpendicular. But of course, they're not, right? I mean, Bill is himself a product of the system that he describes, um, although he's not working in it anymore. It's a big part of his life and he doesn't pretend otherwise. Uh, and so I think that's also, I think, a model for an essayist in the sense that, you know, you place yourself in a story. It's not only about you, um, but surely at the same time, you can make a statement about how you see the world. That's also at the same time, a statement about your place within that world. Uh, um, in, the, in, the final, in the final paper for the class that Bill always visits, I have the students write a speech that they would give at the next convocation, that is to the incoming fresh people of the next year, um, that asked them kind of to reflect not on their first year of college, but to reflect on it through the prism of these readings. And again, hopefully through an exercise like that, they get the idea. Of course, this is personal. It's about your person. It's about your life. Um, and it's also about this great big world out there and the way the two of them intersect. Wow. Okay. So I would like us to get right into the book then. I'm going to read part of an excerpt of the first essay, Solitude and Leadership. On page 13 of The End of Solitude, Bill addresses the plebe class at United States Military Academy, West Point, by saying, quote, I'm going to talk about a novel that some of you may have read, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. And if you haven't read it, you've almost certainly seen a movie that is based on it, Apocalypse Now. Marlowe in the novel becomes Captain Willard, played by Martin Sheen. Mr. Kurtz in the novel becomes Colonel Kurtz, played by Marlon Brando. But the novel is not about Vietnam. It's about colonialism in the Belgian Congo three generations before Vietnam. Marlowe, not a military officer, but a merchant marine, a civilian ship's captain is sent by the company that is running the country under charter from the Belgian crown to sail upriver, deep up the Congo River, to retrieve a manager who has ensconced himself in the jungle and gone rogue, just as Colonel Kurtz does in the movie. Now, every reader recognizes that the novel is about imperialism and colonialism and race relations and the darkness that lies in the human heart. But I eventually realized, as I taught the novel over and over again, that it is also about bureaucracy. The company, as Conrad calls it, is after all just that, a company with rules and procedures and ranks and people in power and people scrambling for power, just like any bureaucracy, just like in a law firm or a government department or, for that matter, a university. Just like, and here's why I'm telling you all this, the bureaucracy that you're about to join. The U.S. Army is not only a bureaucracy, it is one of the largest and most famously bureaucratic bureaucracies in the world. It was the army, after all, that gave us that indispensable bureaucratic acronym, SNAFU, that came from the US Army and World War II, end quote. So Bill, so John, what is the moral of the story and how can solitude lead to whistleblowing? Furthermore, if solitude is indeed the key to becoming a corruption fighter, why are today's religious, quote unquote, bureaucracies considered so corrupt, Bill? Well, let me say, first of all, that while I talk about uh, the importance of what you're calling whistleblowing in the essay, the ability to stand up uh, to corruption in your organization or to misdeeds in your organization, that's not primarily what the, what, it's, what the piece is about, but it is about well, I mean, I'm, 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 it's called solitude and leadership, right? And I'm talking to these future army officers. 
And uh, I was asked to talk to them about solitude because I had written that previous essay, The End of Solitude. And I wanted to find a way to explain to them what I thought was the importance of that cultivation and of, of an inner self to an audience that was, I knew would be very different from the kinds of students I was used to teaching in the Ivy League, who would at least be theoretical, theoretically receptive to the idea of cultivating the inner self. I thought if I got up at West Point and talked about that, you know, the civilian with the, you know, wire rim glasses and that they would, you know. So I looked around to try to see what was, what was gonna be really important to them that I could leverage. And it's, it became immediately clear just from looking at their website that leadership is a sacred term there. And indeed, I think the reason this is so relevant, and I should say this essay is actually, actually ended up traveling very widely, not just in the military, but in business circles. Leadership has become a kind of sacred word uh, across American institutions, including higher education. Everybody wants to be a leader. Everybody wants to tell you that they're gonna teach you to be a leader, blah, blah, blah. Well, what does leadership really mean? And I talk about heart of darkness because I think very often it really just means climbing the greasy pole of some bureaucracy. And to me, that's actually the opposite of leadership, which involves, and this is my argument, cultivating some kind of self that's gonna be able to push back against whatever the world pushes against you, including maybe your supervisors, the norms of your institution, whatever it is. That's what that's about. Um, let me stop there and ask for John's thoughts. Yeah, I mean, to, to me, it, the essay fit nicely into the other critiques of leadership that you see in Excellent Sheep, because really the way I read it, and maybe Bill doesn't, it's, it's a critique of the meritocracy, right? I mean, we do have a crisis of leadership in this country. The, the leadership people aren't wrong about that. Um, uh, but I think what we learned from Bill's work is that they're just, they're, they're, uh, they're wrong about the genesis of this. They actually caused it by creating this system where everybody feels like they've earned the status that they have. To me, that's really the heart of the problem. You know, um, one of the things I do with my students is I, I give them JFK's Harvard application which through the magic of the internet, you can just with a couple clicks, you can find it. And it's hilarious. I mean, it's hilarious in retrospect because um, his essay, why do you want to go to Harvard? He says, my dad went to Harvard and I've always wanted to be a Harvard man, which of course aligns the question about why he first went to Princeton right before he got ill and dad sent him out to Arizona yeah. to take the cure. Yeah, so he didn't always want to be a Harvard man. It's, it, it, it's also inaccurate. Um, but it's just hilariously nepotistic, as is the letter in the file, the admissions file to the Kennedy Library's uh, credit is all online. Um, there's a letter from Joseph P. saying, essentially, my son has been kind of a desultory F up. And when he gets to Harvard, will you help him get his act together? Wow. So the fact that he's going to go to Harvard is a fait accompli to the point that the dad is actually acknowledging all the kids' deficits. So you give this to the students and the students are like, how did this guy ever get in? And it's a good question, right? Because he would not get in now, even as a candidate, not with that application. But the part that they always miss is that precisely because it's so nakedly nepotistic and well, inadequate, JFK never for a moment thought he deserved to be at Harvard. That would have been a ridiculous notion. The entire reason he was at Harvard was because he was a candidate. And I'm not gonna make a brief for that system either. I don't think Bill does in his work, but it did have an interesting upside, which was this thing called noblesse oblige, which was real. It was absolutely real, precisely because you didn't think you earned it. You had a duty to somebody else because you were really a product of good fortune. The problem with the students today who imagine themselves as leaders is they actually think that they earned their way there. And I often say to my students, you've got to be very careful with this because you don't want to discount all the effort that they put in to get to a place like Penn. And it's real. And I say, look, I've, I've got two daughters, too. They went to elite schools. I saw what they expended to get there. But 
they also had a pretty good head start having myself and my wife as parents and living in a place with good public schools and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't earn any of that. And I think the real problem with the leadership class now is you've got people that think they actually deserve to be the leaders instead of people that were born into it. Uh, not to not to go to the obvious, but uh, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Yes. I mean, that was absolutely the ethos of that WASP aristocracy. Now, I think it's probably fair to assume that most of those WASP aristocrats, and obviously there are parallels in European countries and other countries as well, most of them probably didn't follow that ideal of leadership which is about duty, sacrifice, honor, other people. But some of them did, you know, you mentioned JFK, I think about FDR and what he wrote about what he learned at Groton, you know, the super elite public, uh, rather private prep yeah. school. Um, yeah. I don't see that ethos anywhere in the contemporary leadership class. And again, not just in America, but throughout the developed world. Yes, and, and, and part of that is also about the way the state itself has been discredited, right? Because so much of that old Kennedy ethos was about serving via the state. And just briefly, I should tell you that I myself and my family are a product of this because my father met JFK by accident on a beach in the French Riviera in 1956. And my dad was there with his law school roommate. Uh, they went to Yale Law School. And Kennedy hung out with them for a couple hours. And basically, and not basically, this is what he said. He said, listen, you know, the people in your law school class are gonna to go to these white shoe law firms on Wall Street, at least the ones that will hire people with the last name of Zimmerman. But you shouldn't do that. You should go to Washington because Washington is where the action is going to be. And, you know, I often relate this story to my students as well because this could come from Mars. This is another planet. Because now we live in a moment where both parties compete in heaping refuse on Washington. Like who likes Washington? Like that's, like that's where ideals go to die. I mean, I read that Congress's approval rating was 8%. That sounds high to me. Like who likes Congress? Like guys who work on the Hill? I mean, the state has been so discredited. And I think that's, I mean, that's really a part of this equation and, and a very sad part. That's really interesting. Yeah, you'd go to the, you'd go work at the State Department, at the CIA, which started with Yale people, yes. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Military, I mean, I think the idea of people from yes. elite backgrounds even just going into the military, inconceivable yeah. now. Right, that's right. Sorry, Are, do other people want to say, want to talk? Lino, it's good to see you again. I think I saw you <laughs> Hello, on this, on this yes. thing. Yes. Well, you know, I, I'm processing all of these things that you are saying, you and John, and I'm actually very interested to uh, to read your books, especially that excellent sheep. Um, just with my experience here in academia, uh, what I'm finding is that uh, instead of me concentrating, when I started 20 years ago, I could just focus more of my effort into teaching and uh, doing my craft, which is I'm a, I'm a concert pianist. And as the years went by, uh, I find that, you know, there is more and more of this bureaucracy that creeps in to my life and to, to my academic life. There's just meetings all over the place. I mean, last week we have meetings after meetings after meetings and it's just, it's just getting out of my ears already. And this bureaucracy and, you know, what I find is that yeah, we meet so much, but we don't accomplish anything. It's just a waste of time. And it's like, what is happening in this atmosphere of academia? I mean, it's just a puzzle to me. And I can't even concentrate. It erodes my desire to practice, to perfect my craft, to teach my students. That's just a comment that I had to make. Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 what Simeon was maybe too too polite to read from that essay was that I realized that Heart of Darkness was about bureaucracy because I finally recognized in the central bureaucrat, this sort of creepily, eve, subtly evil manager, the chairman of my department. Uh, but more broadly, I mean, David Graeber, the late David Graeber wrote in his book, Utopia of Rules, which is about bureaucracy, about 
not just uh, nonprofit or governmental bureaucracies, but even in the corporate sector, the tendency of bureaucracies to, to constantly grow because the way bureaucrats acquire power is to put more people underneath themselves. Um, I think we could probably say a lot about that. Okay. Yeah, if Max Weber were on this call, he would just say this is the downside of modernity. I mean, this is why reading Weber is such is such a downer. You know, he said when when things get to a certain uh, a, a certain scale, um, that uh, uh, charismatic authority is replaced by bureaucratic authority, uh, and you know, bureaucratic authority is rule bound, um, uh, and it has to do with boxes and flowcharts. And those boxes can theoretically be filled by anybody. Um, and so it kind of makes all of us into functionaries uh, in, in a very real way. Um, okay. Yeah, no, I was, no, go ahead. Sorry, um, if I could just say, you know, again, you know, the, the layers of bureaucracy, uh, there is the dean, there is the assistant dean, there is the assistant to the assistant dean, there is the second assistant to the, uh, oh my goodness. And then they are making <laughs> all of these rules for us to do. And it's just, again, checking the boxes. Um, the other thing is that um, colleges, especially, you know, my college where it, we pride into liberal college, uh, diversity of the disciplines, but when the bureaucracy comes into play, what I find is that they want to uniformize, I think I've made up a word, uh, all the disciplines. So of course, arts and humanities are different from the sciences, from the business, from theology and religious studies, but they all want to make exactly the same uh, metric rule for all the classes and all the workloads of the faculty and all the preparations. It wants to even it out so that it, everybody is homogeneous and there is no more specialty of, you know, the music is different from finance, from theology, and the diversity becomes diluted, if I may say so. Okay. Yeah, interestingly, at the same time that diversity is now this big buzzword because it, but it only means one particular thing. Um, you know, not to be self-serving and bring this back to my book, but um, I think as John suggested, uh, that as Weber said, you know, I think bureaucracy is unavoidable in mass society with large scale enterprises. I mean, it, these things need to be organized. So what I'm, what I'm always caring about is how can the individual be an individual or if you're a young person, how can you become an individual? And as I say in the preface to the book, when I have to think about what all these disparate essays had in common, I think that's what they have in common, is that I believe in this idea of being an individual, which means being unique and insisting on your uniqueness, and if need be, um, taking some hits for insisting on your uniqueness, like when you're a whistleblower. Fantastic. So and, and let's and let's also remember that the the phenomenon Lena was describing in higher ed is relatively new. So there used to be more faculty than administrators, right? And in the 1990s, those lines crossed, and the number of faculty uh, um, uh, uh, declined, and the number of administrators went up. And okay. you know this too. I mean. Again, Weber could have predicted him in some ways, but the timing suggests to me that, again, this wasn't just a product of some broad scale modernity force. I mean, these were human beings making very explicit decisions about what they valued. Um, and so, you know, now there are state universities. I read recently the University of Maryland had 12 vice provosts. Wow. <laughs> and, and that's, that's not, my... I mean, and that's kind of a mid size. It's not nearly as big as, say, the University of Texas or the University of California. Right. Um, uh, you know, what do all those people do? That's a good question. I, I don't. I, I wouldn't hazard an answer. But one of the things they do is they hire other little deans or deanlets, as we call them, right? Uh, and and they make themselves indispensable in their in their own perverse way, uh, um, because you have to now go through them in order to do the things that you want to do. Uh, incidentally, University of Maryland is one of my alma mater. <laughs> there you go. Maybe you'll be a vice provost there one day. Right? And the other many, many others are. 
Yeah. I think poor Simeon wants to uh, direct us to the next topic. Let's continue. We have, uh, Does one... anyone have any suggestions on how to turn this around? Bill? How to turn around the, the, this, this administrative elephantiasis in academia? Absolutely. I mean, people, you know, pe many people have been complaining about it for a long time, which suggests that nothing is ever going to happen. I mean, I suppose you could have state legislatures since, you know, three quarters of college students are at public universities, you could have state legislatures putting their foot down. I'm very reluctant, you know, I know that if state legislators had their way, a lot of them would just want to abolish tenure and start firing left-wing professors. But um, if they're going to do anything, I would like to see them do that. Let's just, you know, just mandate University of Maryland, the Maryland state legislator says, I don't care who you fire, but you have to fire 50% of your administrators. Is that going to happen? No. Probably not. And, and, you know, if I may just add, it's an incentive in the system, because when we hire a new dean, a new provost, assistant dean, whatever administrator, they come in tenured and they earn more than I am earning after working there for 20 years. Tenured. And I work for my tenure for six years. John? Well, the other thing that I would do if I were king and we don't have enough time this afternoon to enumerate all the reasons that won't happen, but I would require all these people to teach. Like, like Lino said, they came in with tenure, they're scholars, right? I mean, they have academic backgrounds and credentials, um, uh, not a full load, right? But I think everyone who's at the university who works at the university should teach something to somebody. We could do that. Uh, we're, we're not going to, but we could, yeah. And well, not being in academia whatsoever, I think that's a very good idea. <laughs> I mean, uh, if it makes some of them find a different line of work. Yeah. Because <laughs> the prospect of teaching, it's a lot yeah. harder to teach than to do probably anything else that happens on campus. Yes, it's it really is. Hard. And John, yeah. you were mentioning that in the 1990s, you saw this, uh, this shift happening or, or that it already- Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's the there's a book about this by Gens ben, uh, ben Ginsberg, which is called The Fall of the Faculty. And basically you've got these lines that cross in the 90s. So, you know, um, you've, 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 you've got the faculty going down and the administrators going up and they sort of cross in the mid 90s. Now, just to be clear to some of the listeners, I mean, you know, all administrators aren't like vice provosts uh, of, of blah, blah, blah at the University of Maryland. I mean, some of them, for example, work in student health services. So an administrator is just defined as a staffer, is defined as anybody who is not a professor. And I often emphasize to my students, you know, like I like staffers, you know, I mean, I like administrators, we need them. And I think, frankly, the mental health apparatus, it's one of the best things that's happened at universities since I was a kid. So it's not that I feel that they're all useless or they're all extraneous. And I think we have to remember that there's, to use the loaded term, a great diversity of administrators with different functions. Yeah. And um, uh, John, back to Dr. Davis' question. So you don't see any of this changing in the near term? Uh, well, look, I mean, I'm a historian. I have a hard enough time figuring out what happened yesterday and uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I, I, I can't, uh, I'm not a soothsayer, but I don't see anything in the tea leaves suggesting that we're going to have fewer administrators for a lot of the reasons that Lino implied. I mean, we've created this perverse incentive structure, right, um, where, you know, the most status and the most dollars and the most power are located in these offices. And so that's what we've actually incentivized faculty to become. That's the highest prize. Interesting. Um, huh. Okay. You know, just interestingly, you mentioned Judge John. I have a couple of my, oh no, three of my colleagues who were concert pianists. They are now deans. They are now administrators. Oh, because yeah. Boy, what a promotion. How can yeah. that, yeah. that be? Well, I think the attraction of the power and the money and the prestige right. is there. And they are administrators. They're no longer performing. I know, but I know, but who sits down at the piano when they're 15 or 16 at their first concert and thinks, well, this is good, but I'd really like to be a dean one day. Yeah. You know. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> on to our next conversation then. 
This is uh, about the essay Just Friends. In the essay Just Friends, Bill writes on the, the mo about the modern concept of friendship between men and women. On page 145, he writes, quote, So if it's common now for men and women to be friends, why do we so rarely hear about it? Why does Hollywood insist that such friendships do not exist? Partly, it is a narrative problem. Friendship isn't courtship. It doesn't have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Stories about friendship of any kind are relatively rare, especially given the enormous place that such friendships have in our lives. And, of course, they're not sexy. We don't get stories about friendship because what we want, or we think we want, are stories about love. Put a man and a woman together on screen, or in the pages of a novel, any man and woman, friends, classmates, colleagues, boss and worker, teacher and student, and we expect the sparks to fly. Yet it isn't just a narrative problem or a Hollywood problem. We have trouble in this culture with any love that isn't based on sex or blood. We understand romantic relationships and we understand family, and that's about all we understand. We don't understand mentorship, the asymmetric love of master and apprentice, professor and student, guide and guided. We don't understand comradeship, the bond that comes from shared intense work, and we don't understand friendship, at least the intimate kind. When we imagine such relationships, we seem to have the to, we seem to have to sexualize them. I cannot think of another area of our lives in which there is so great a gap between what we do and what we say we do. Friendship between the sexes may no longer be a political issue, but it is an issue of liberation, the friendship of the freedom to love whom you want in the way that you want. Maybe it's time that we all took it out of the closet, end quote. Bill, John, what was the consensus concept of friendship before Western feminism? What is it today? And what might it be tomorrow? Well, I should say that this is the second essay on friendship that appears in that book. The first one is called Faux Friendship, you know, F-A-U-X. Again, not my title, but it's kind of a follow on from the end of Solitude essay. And it's about how friendship is changing as a result of social media, but it's also sort of an attempt to redeem what was going to be sort of my next academic book. It was going to be like my big book, you know, after my first book, which was on Jane Austen, and it was going to be a cultural history of friendship in the last two centuries. And thank God I had to leave academia because I'd probably still be working on it. It was much too large a topic. But uh, so one that I'm very interested in because like everybody, but you know, friendship has, was, has been really important to me in my life. I would also say friendship with girls, which I started to learn how to enact when I was in adolescence for biographical reasons that we need not go into. But, but as I dug into friendship in general, I did write an article or two about it before I left academia. I, I learned that there's a history to friendship. I mean, I think like many things, we just sort of take for granted that it's always been what it is now. And in fact, that's not true at all. And in, when, you know, before what we call modernity, before say the late 18th century, uh, friendship was much less important because society was much more highly structured and it's the nature of friendship to be unstructured. So our kin relationships were more important and feudal relationships were more important. And when you look at when what people like Aristotle or Cicero or Montaigne write about friendship, they write about it as this rare and lofty thing that's that's based in sort of a, a high commitment to virtue, and and uh, and um, uh, you know and we we sort of have myth you know sort of uh, examples from myth and literature David and Jonathan you know um, Nisus and Euryalus and in in Virgil. Uh, really interesting to me that as all of that, you know, as the structure sort of the structures of society break down and break open, and we begin to embrace an ideology of equality, friendship suddenly becomes the most now the most important thing. In some sense, the relationship in terms of which all others are understood. You know, parents want their kids to regard them as friends, siblings treat each other like friends. And if you're not friends, then when you're adults, you may not have much of a relationship with each other, um, and so on and so forth. So 
part of that is relationships between the sexes and the friendships between men and women and how feminism sort of, if you, if you read the literature of like, I, I guess what we now call first wave feminism in the late 19th century, friendship becomes this sort of this important goal as a, as a way of reimagining relationships between men and women that are not relationships of domination. Um, uh, but that's uh, but friendship between the sexes is only part of a much larger transformation. I mean, the the other thing that I would add there is that um, you know I think there's a really important gender piece here. Um, you know, if you look at if you look at the work by uh, like Angus Denton at Princeton about uh, these kind of deaths of despair, one of the things that you find in contemporary life is that men especially um, are profoundly lonely um, and, and uh, report that they don't have friends and even more don't know how to make them. And so I thought about this as I was reading uh, Bill's essay on this subject because, you know, Wallace Stegner wrote this book called Crossing to Safety like 40 years ago, that's right on point. And one of the characters in Crossing to Safety, which is a book about friendship, um, describes friendship as the most human and the most volitional of the relationships because it's not something you're born into like a son and parent. And it's also not a contract or a vow like a marriage. Um, so it's something that human beings have to create and then recreate you know, over and over again. And something that I find extremely sad is that it's clear that a lot of Americans, especially men, don't know how to do that. Why are there so many more friends after both your definitions between women and much less between men? Well, that, I mean, that's the question that John poses, but I, you know, I mean, uh, maybe I'm just being defensive as a man, maybe I'm resisting essentialism, but mainly I think I just want to historicize this a little bit. I don't know that, it's hard for me to accept that uh, men are just less capable of friendship. I understand that men in some ways are less sort of sociable or pro-social than women. And maybe there are biological reasons for that, or maybe it's socialization. Um, I think a lot of it is biological, but, but let me say this, like, what? Because because John underlined that men are getting more and more lonely. I think Americans and no doubt Westerners in general, but but men in particular are getting more and more lonely. So one of the big, I you know, people have written about this bowling alone. One of the big features of recent decades is a decline of old now not the formal feudal structures of relationship, but informal structures like bowling leagues. That's where the title bowling alone comes from, but all kinds of civic associations, voluntary associations. And then the internet comes along, let alone the pandemic and kind of rivets us to these screens. So what I'm saying is that I think, and I've been actually thinking about this lately, like what does friendship look like? And I think I think we, and even I, tend to have a model of friendship that's more like female friendship. And maybe that's because I'm sort of a more, I'm not gonna say feminine man, but like, I think I'm not as, you know, my ways of relating are more, you know, in other words, long conversations, sharing your feelings, blah, blah, blah. Guys have ways of relating to each other, you know, but it tends to be nonverbal. You know, you go fishing together, you go play basketball together, and there's bonds and intimacy that develop from that. And I think mutual understanding, even if it's unspoken understanding, but what if those things happen less? Right. And after all, and I'm realizing this as I'm talking, communication online is verbal. Yeah, yeah no, we don't, we don't have the infrastructure that sustained friendship. I think that's the historical point, you know, or we've lost big parts of it. And let's remember that, you know, in addition to these sorts of, you know, uh, civic organizations, in many cases, melting away, I think the most important phenomenon that we're so close to, we can't understand is that religious activity has plummeted. So, you know, in the past 20 years, it seems that um, uh, the two things that the social sciences measure are a stated religious affiliation and weekly um, uh, religious attendance. And it seems like those things have gone down 20% in 20 years, which is a remarkable decline. And I think one that 
we're almost too close to you to understand, but I think it's very much a part of this discussion, or it should be, uh, because if you talk about the organization sustain people, including their friendships, I mean, the religious organizations were at the very top of the list. Absolutely. Okay. So on that solemn note, let's move on to Bill's essay, The True Church. On page 149 through 150, Bill writes, quote, I have been to Jewish services of all kinds, have seen Catholics, Lutherans, and Episcopalians at worship, Muslims, Hindus, Jains, and Sikhs, Chinese and Tibetan Buddhists, Golden Temple, Holy Sepulcher, Wailing Wall, Lahaza, Bodh Gaya, Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. But the truest religion I have ever witnessed was a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. A friend had reached his 20th anniversary of sobriety, and I came to a meeting to help him celebrate. What I saw there was religion stripped to its bones, austerely beautiful like a piece of shaker furniture. No priesthood, no prelacy, no special garments or sacred, sacred objects, no shibboleths of membership, a bare minimum of custom and formula, a congregation called by need, not duty. Meaning? springing from the bottom up, not from mythology or dogma or scripture, language handed down by rote, but from the particularities of individual experience, words spoken for the first time, not the trillionth. One person said, quote, I don't wake up anymore feeling like I want to die. I may not always wake up feeling like I want to live, but I no longer wake up feeling like I want to die, end quote. Another said, quote, when I drank that first beer, I had no idea what was going to happen after that, end quote. A third replied, quote, when I drank, I knew exactly what was going to happen. I always wound up in the same place. Now that I don't drink, I have no idea, and it's wonderful, end quote. Most of all, a sense that all this really mattered in the most immediate and urgent way, the overwhelming feeling that I've gotten from the most from most of the religious services that I've attended is that none of it has to do with anything other than itself. This time, instead of pulpit abstractions about faith and service or vague ideas about attaining some future blessed state, what I saw were people fighting for their lives right here, right now. Meeting, as in business meeting, is a good word for it. There was no room for anything but the most concretely practical considerations, that is, the most authentically personal ones. For most people, church is for Sunday. AA members go to meetings every day. The program is religion set down in the midst of life, not a, sp a special sanctum that we co keep cordoned off in our brains. One of AA's acronyms is sober. Quote, son of a bitch, everything's real. End quote. Amen. Selah. Bill? Holiday thoughts? <laughs> well, I, I should say, first of all, that uh, Simeon just read the entirety of that piece. And I only mention that to say that a, there are a whole bunch of pieces in the book that are very short. They come from a, t uh, a couple of years that I spent writing short weekly essays for the American Scholar. And that gave me an opportunity to, to speak about a lot of different things uh, and express thoughts that uh, <clears throat> Uh, weren't you know I didn't you know uh, we're too short for a for a full length essay, um, and that's one of them. And um, uh, I, I think uh, you know I grew up in a Orthodox Jewish house and went to private schools until I was kicked out of those too. Just as I was later kicked out of academia, there's sort of a pattern there. Um, so, uh, so I've always had kind of a complicated relationship with religion. And I think uh, seeing my friend's uh, AA meeting was, um, was clarifying. Uh, I, yeah. I, you know, I, uh, I'm glad you chose that section, uh, Sydney, and not just because I thought it was beautiful, but because for me, it actually underscores or points to what I see as the most interesting tension in what uh, in what Bill is writing. I think the tensions about religion are profound, and this is my reading of them. Um, in some ways, Bill is asking us in his work on higher ed to return to a kind of religious model, a religious ideal. 
Um, these institutions that he writes about and that I teach at, they were all founded by deeply religious people who felt that we needed these institutions in order to develop people spiritually, to develop their soul, which is a word that comes up a lot in Bill's writings. And yet when you get to the part about his own religious training, it's the antithesis of that. In fact, he sees his own religious training as working against that kind of soul development. Um, uh, and so I guess the question for me is, you know, how, how uh, we can perhaps revive some of the quasi-religious functions that higher education used to have um, and, and subtract the dogma that, that, that uh, Bill describes from his own youth. Or that I might describe from the current situation of academia. Yeah, yeah, which is, which is, yes, another kind of religion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that that's beautifully put. Uh, it's so nice to be having this conversation because I'm learning so much, including about my own thoughts. Um, and one of those persistent thoughts is, it's what John said, but it's also sort of more deeply how can we as, if we are secular people, not all of us are, but insofar as we are, or insofar as our institutions are, and our societies are, how do we recapture that soul, that ability to nurture the soul and to enact what the soul is about without the supports of religious faith? Right, and, and religious and, structures. And to me, the really interesting juncture in the book is when Steven Pinker weighs in on this. And Steven Pinker just says, soul? Like, WTF? Like, I can't see that. I can't measure that. Uh, I can't observe it over time. It doesn't exist. Yeah. That's what the majority of people feel today. The soul does not exist. Mm -hmm. Bill, do you want to jump in about that? About that comment uh, that... Uh, Pinker, Pinker? Married, I believe he he was in the you, you're talking about that in the context of of academia of teaching liberal arts of getting people to go for something that is more than those uh, SAT exams or measurable by the meritocracy is that right right or 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 subject to empirical research I mean that was part of the point he was making too you know we, we you know I'm a psychologist we hire psychologists who are good at their psychological research not about the soul um yeah i'm i'm curious about what other people have to say it might be you know, if i can i just offer a thought uh partially in response to dr davis question you know part of what we've been talking about is reform and uh i just wonder if reform may not come from outside these institutions rather from within them and I wonder if some of these institutions may have to collapse under their own weight at some point uh, before they reform themselves. Right, right. And, and people important. have been saying this, right, especially as the universities get even more drawn into the culture wars and the people who founded the University of Austin, Texas, you know, that project, uh, that's kind of their claim that we just need to have new institutions. And I would say, a couple of things. First of all, people have been predicting the demise of the university for years now. And they have, I mean, if you look back at the tech utopianists, when the MOOCs, the massive open online courses were starting around 2010, there were predictions, I, if I'm remembering right, that in, in, within 10 years, there would only be 50 universities in the entire world, because everyone would just get their education online. There's actually been no change in the number of American colleges and universities, except for the fact that some of the for-profit, you know, diploma mills have gone out of business. So I don't think that's gonna happen. And I would also say that, uh, and I sort of say this I, to people who wanna start a third party because they're so fed up with the two that we have. Um, it's very, very hard to start a university or a political party it's much easier to try to seize control of ones that exist, which happens in political parties all the time. I mean, Donald Trump remade the, Bill Clinton remade the Democratic Party. But then of course, the question becomes, how do you reform the universities? And um, 
I guess we sort of been I guess we've sort of been there already. I mean, I, I'd like to believe that if enough parents and students complain, but then I worry that they're not even going to be complaining about the right thing. You know, they'll just get rid of the English departments altogether. Right. I mean, this is the thing, you know, I mean, uh, it's, it's a little ironic. Those of us who want these reforms were, were always um, hoping or pleading that the parents and the students will kind of show up with pitchforks. But to Bill's point, maybe they won't want things that we want. And, and also, like, what's the line between that and this thing called consumerism? You know, I think it's so interesting, right? Everyone likes democracy, but most people don't like consumerism. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, it may well be that we have precisely the universities that we deserve because the customer comes first and the customer's spoken. Um, and this is what this is what people want. They want they want a set of credentials they can sell in the market. Um, uh, they're willing to sacrifice fiscally if they see a return on the investment. Um, they don't want to work too hard for it and they'll cut corners whenever they can. And so, you know, I, sometimes cynics are right. And when the cynics say that perhaps we have the higher ed system that a democracy demands, um, it's a little ironic because of course I instinctually rebel at that because I see education at all levels as preparing us for democracy in the sense of making us into critical citizens, which by the way, higher ed has a very poor record of doing. But this is the tension that's run through my entire work, actually. Uh, you know, um, the kind of skills and habits I call democratic education or democratic period. What if the demos, you know, like those pesky citizens, what if they don't want it? You know, is it even democratic? And, you know, John Dewey wrote exactly one essay where he actually seemed to take this on. And it's very obscure. And so far as I know, I'm the only person ever to quote it. And it's, it's an essay he wrote in 1903, which is called, um, Are the Schools Doing What the People Want Them to Do? Which is a great title. And he says, no, they're not. And they can't until the schools instruct the people about what they want. <laughs> And, you know, I, that just, that goes through too many contortions for me. And school ends up playing a role sort of like revolution does in a, like a Marxoid framework. It's like the good thing that has to happen for all the other good things. But like school is itself a product of democracy. Um, all these institutions we're talking about are created by democratic publics. Um, uh, and so, you know, how do you, persuade the demos that they should want this thing called democratic education. Um, uh, I think that, that for me, that's a fundamental question. And I'll admit, I've not done a particularly good job of it. I mean, I, I've tried and I'm not gonna stop, but um, I don't think that we have won that argument. I think that, you know, at this point, it's fair to say that we've lost it. You were actually yeah. making me think of Brecht, you know, we need to get a new people. For yeah, exactly. to work. Let's fire uh, these people and get another one. Yeah. But I will say, I mean, and, and John is, you know, a, a, a great historian of higher education, and I've learned so much from him, including from, I guess, still your most recent book, Amateur Hour, or The Amateur yeah. Hour about higher, it's yeah. the only, it's the first history of college teaching in America. But what you talk about throughout is how unhappy students have been with the teaching they've gotten. And people are unhappy about a lot of things about academia. They're unhappy about the cost. Employers in surveys express great levels of dissatisfaction at the quality of graduates that schools are, are, are producing. So I absolutely take your point about how the only problem with democracy is the actual demos, <laughs> for sure. I think we may be getting the politics we want. But the thing about higher ed is that it is such a an inelastic market. It's not like you go to a place, you buy an apple, you don't like the apple, you go to a different place the next time. I mean, it's this four, you know, it's this four year black box that you insert yourself into. So it seems like everyone's unhappy. So it's, you know, right? That's yeah. the thing. No, no, there, there is. There, there is this great unhappiness, but what do you do about it? Right, right, right. How do you channel it and how do you channel it into something that might be better, right? Um, you know, I, um, I, Republicans hate us because they think that we indoctrinate people into kind of liberal bromides and Democrats hate us because we're too expensive. And in different ways, I think they're both right, actually, you know, okay. and there are other complaints besides that. 
So it's not that everything's peachy keen or people think it's peachy keen. I just don't think we've imagined a way actually to make it better that can bring it along enough people um, in that project. Okay, so final um, happy thoughts, John? <laughs> well, let me just say, I'm really happy to be toasting this, fa this fantastic book. I hope anyone who's listening will purchase it as soon as possible and maybe um, give it to somebody for Christmas or Hanukkah. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I, I, also, I also think, or at least hope that um, it's discussions like this and frankly work like Bill's that can get us um, off our rear ends um, and get us thinking about um, uh, an institution and a world that will be better than this one because this is not good enough. Yeah. Okay, Bill, final thoughts, happy thoughts? Um, well, I think my happy thought is that as frustrating as the institutions are, as resistant to change, including the political scene, and again, I mean, this is so much of what I, I write about. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't mean that it's determinative of what we do as individuals and what we do in small groups and what we do with our friends. Uh, there's, there's, you know, I think there, you know, the, the state of the world may be desperate, but I think people uh, deeply underestimate their capacity to create better local conditions just for themselves in their own lives if they're willing to you know get off social media or prioritize spending time with friends or whatever it is and and one other thing i'll add just as we're talking happy thoughts is you know i'm just glad to live in a country where we have the right to criticize our institutions let's remember that in many parts of the world you can't um, uh, and also, frankly, a country where the, the leading military institution would invite something like Bill Duresowitz to give a, a graduation talk about leadership. I mean, I read that piece feeling pretty darn patriotic. Um, uh, I think that's a fantastic thing. And, and uh, again, I don't know enough about the rest of the world to know how many other military institutions would invite a speaker like that, but my guess is not many. Okay, so let's see how we can stay in touch with yeah. these two fantastic guests of ours. Here is Bill's website, uh, BillDeresowitz.com, which I've already put in the chat room. Bill, so people can buy the book here. They can reach out to you if they've got questions. Is that right? Absolutely. They, Absolutely. I'd love to is, hear from people. All they do is they just click on that, and then yep. they'll you just click on contact, and your email will directly go to Bills, you get his email there right away. He's uh, ra waiting for your inf uh, for your comments to talk to you, to uh, reach out to him about any of these extraordinary extraordinary essays that he's written that we just read, just but a few of them. Jonathan can be reached here at gse.upenn.edu, and people can reach out to you at the at that email address. Is that right? Yeah, John? absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Fantastic. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So feel free to reach out to John with your questions, uh, also about his book, um, uh, The Amateur Hour. So there it is. And I will put that here in the chat room right now for those people who would like to reach out for, to Jonathan. There it is. Thank you so very much to William Bill Dreschowitz and to Jonathan John Zimmerman. And thank you, Simeon, and everybody else. for. Yeah, thanks coming. a lot. That was fun. Yeah, yeah, happy holidays. Thank you very much. Okay. Nice talk. Let's, nice take a, a, let's take a look at next. Uh, this is January 4th. So this is in two weeks, two Wednesdays from now. So this is January 4th after the new year. Ron Rosenstock, The World Through My Eyes. Photographer Ron Rosenstock brings us the natural world through his camera lens. He travels all over the globe to meet the earth on its own terms and has just returned from the deserts of Morocco with a collection of his newest awe-inspiring vistas. Will his striking photos of Mother Earth be the sole inheritance we bequeath the next generation of her inhabitants? Ron wants his incredible discoveries to stir our collective human conscience to act before it comes to that. Rather than speaking on her behalf, as has become commonplace, 
He allows nature to speak directly to us in her own inimitable voice. Come welcome Ron Rosenstock to our show, and let's listen to what she has to say. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simeonmorrow.com. Again, that is Wednesday in one week and two weeks. Ron Rosenstock, The World Through My Eyes. Once again, thank you so very much to William Dresowitz and to Jonathan Zimmerman. Thank you to Professor Lino Rivera and to all of our participants who participated in this fantastic discussion. Thank you to Agnieszka and Benoit Rivolet for their support of this show. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile. From New London, New Hampshire, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the Bay Area, California, and Portland, Oregon, goodbye, and see you in two weeks. Happy holidays. Bye-bye.